uh, here we are, week three. Uh, Susie and I are here to answer uh, your questions from the Ball of Confusion Forum. We had three students uh, submit questions, Brody, Effie, and Julian. And so I'm gonna take the first question and then Susie will take the second, I'll take the third. We'll just kind of talk our way through this. So uh, Brody, uh, his question, uh, in chapter five, it says, the more a company exports their wares, the better. What does it mean when it sa it's saying wares? So wares, wares is another word for product. Um, it, it could imply a service, but mostly it's, it's a product. It actually is a word that comes from two or 3,000 years ago, uh, and it, it, it's direct translation is pottery. And it was in um, street markets where there wasn't any shopping malls, obviously, two or 3,000 years ago, but people would get together in cities and set up little uh, stores and they would sell their wares. And that was the wares was a lot of what wares were were pottery. It was all kinds of versions and things of pottery. So that's the direct translation. But today, modern application is wares are your product. So if I'm, if I'm Nike, my wares are my running shoes. So that's the kind of implication. It's, it's um, somewhat in a direct way of saying product, but it's um, just a different way of saying that. And like Steve was saying too, it's kind of hard to imagine, but services actually fall under that category as well. Um, nail salons, hair studios, anything that provides a service, cleaning services, um, anything like that. It's, it's kind of imagined because you get an idea that wares is something that's tangible and sometimes it's not. So mm -hmm. you just kind of have to bear that in mind too. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, let's go to Effie. All right. Um, Effie says, or asks, I should say, does technology put an organization uh, in a better advantage to create higher product turnover every year, as does marketing successfully? And if it does, why are some organizations still and their marketing, still send their marketing representatives to trade shows? Um, that's a good question. Technology has, has given us such advantages in so many ways. Um, manufacturing, uh, production, distribution. I mean, in almost any type of business transaction or, or situation, technology is involved, particularly in marketing and sales. We, we've completely changed how we look at things now. We have a different strategy. Uh, our strategic planning is so totally different due to all the technology that's out there now. Um, backing up though to marketing and sales, e each company when it comes to sales and marketing, almost every company has a website. And websites are developed to you know, reach a, a lot of people at one time. So it, 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 it affords you a situation where you can expand your customer base. Um, websites from each company, they can do a lot of things. Um, they are very informational. They, they, they show you the competition. They give you um, all kinds of advantages as to what their product can do and so on and so forth. But there's a few things that they can't do. They can do basically, you can hear, and you can see, but you can't smell, you can't touch, and you can't taste. And in my industry, trade shows are just huge because in my industry, I'm in the food industry, so we like to touch and we like to smell and we like to taste and all those things. So therefore that kind of gives you a situation where you can't get that through technology. There are certain aspects that you can get, but those direct things that are so um, down to earth, you can't, you can't experience those things through a website. So that's why it's so important to send representatives to trade shows. And plus it provides an, a, a base of interested people who are all in like mind for products that, um, are, that they need for whatever they do. What yeah, do you think, Steve? Well, it, in in the I would I would come just kind of an interesting different way of coming at it. <clears throat> Every business has to really know their customers, and and in, in, you can call it a target market, a market niche. And knowing your customer isn't necessarily just being able to describe them. It also means you've got some level of a relationship with them. So, 
when you look at it, to the beginning of your question was asking, does technology put an organization a better advantage? It, it can, if the organization understands that they need to ask the customer how they want to transact business. <clears throat> so it, with this COVID circumstance we're in, a lot of us have, who've been active doing transactions online and some of us who've never done it, have become um, knowledgeable about how to do that and good at it, whether it's Uber Eats or wh whatever it might be. So, so part of the, the answer to the question is that, that the, the organization that's selling a product or a service needs to stay very close to their customer and observe how they want to conduct business. If they want to conduct business online or using technology, the company has to build a bridge there. Um, if the customer does it, like to Susie's point, if they need to have a sensual aspect to it, taste, sight, smell, then you need to use technology in a different way to accommodate the need of the customer. Because if, if you don't provide that, the customer is going to seek it elsewhere. So uh, the, I, I guess to conclude this, I would say technology is not the answer. Technology is an enabler of the answer. And the company needs to really think about what, what is the customer's question and the answer to that. It's not technology. It's technology is underneath the answer to that question. And sometimes it's a lot of technology, sometimes it's very little. But um, if you're not paying attention to it, you can be left out of the market because your competitors are gonna be doing what you should be doing. That's, that's the way I would build on that. Um, okay, Julian. Uh, Julian asks a question. Julian says, uh, not sure if I bypass on a part of where it's discussed a global vision but I'm curious of what it is and how to plan for a successful one. So the question is, what is global vision and how can one develop a successful one? And then secondly, what is your preferred way of entering the market? So um, a global vision would be, you're basically saying that, that the, your marketplace is the globe. It's any, any, um, you know, I'd say first world, second world, third, depending on, I mean, if, if I'm into, a nonprofit and I'm trying to educate children, my global vision wouldn't be everyone within a five mile radius of my house. It might be every country in the world where there are children. So then the next question, once you have a vision, the vision really kind of puts a fence around where you want to make an impact. And then the next most important uh, point is to build a strategy. And then following that is tactics. So if I wanted to, um, if I, my nonprofit was to find potable water around the world, the drinkable water and getting people access to it, then I need to have a vision of what that would look like. I need to be able to describe it. Uh, what is it, what it is, what it's not. And then once I have a fairly good idea of what that vision is, it, it could be what countries, what continents, it could be what kinds of equipment, then I need to say, I have to describe, describe a strategy, which are, strategy means anything over 12 months, roughly. Usually in a business setting, it's, it's one year to three years. That's a strategy. It's not detailed and specific, it's directional. Um, so a strategy on my water, nonprofit water company might be, I'm gonna focus on the African continent first. Uh, in the next three years. And then the tactics would be, okay, if, if it's this continent of Africa, what are the doable, observable, measurable things I'm gonna do in the next 12 months, tactics, next 12 months, that leads me to fulfill that three-year strategic goal and ulti ultimately my global vision. So um, maybe another oversimplistic way to do this is um, a, a lot of, uh, children who are growing up and they follow sports will be very passionate about a vision of playing in the NBA or playing on the pro golf tour or playing in professional softball or gymnastics and they'll have a vision it's not a global vision but it's a vision uh, that they can describe them performing and then the short-term things are going to camps, going to schools, getting mentors, getting coaches, getting into games and, and circumstances that test and improve your abilities. So you would take that kind of notion and apply it to a business. 
um, you, you get a better focus, short and long-term outcome. So global vision, um, a vision is important uh, of some sort. Global would be just, you're, you're looking at the, the world. Um, a couple of other examples, the European Union's made up 27 countries. Uh, before the European Union became a reality, every one of those 27 countries had to develop a vision of the globe on their own. Very difficult to do if you're a tiny, small country. So one of the purposes of getting the European Union together was to have 27 countries operate as one looking at the global marketplace. And it gave them a lot of ability to uh, compete with China and the United States and other, other countries. So global vision is important. Uh, can, you, can you operate a business without it? Sure. Um, how do you enter a market? Um, if you have a global vision, you have to understand the marketplace. Every marketplace is different. You have language, you have culture, you have borders. So uh, if I'm going to go into the Philippines, I have to understand the language I have to understand the culture, I have to understand the borders. There's a whole, if you go online and, and, and look, they don't look very far, there's a whole list, a uh, long list of American companies that decided to go into countries around the globe and made terrible, terrible decisions. Um, I'll give you one example, Gerber baby food. We were familiar with Gerber baby food, um, little jars with a little Gerber baby on the front of it and it's uh, strained peas, something, we would think it's awful, but babies might like. Um, they decided to go into the Middle East because there was a lot of malnutrition. Their global vision was to feed the world. They were gonna go in the Middle East and, and provide food for all of that area in the Middle East. And uh, they geared up, they produced the product, they set up distribution points. They, the day opening day, they th threw the doors open. No one bought their product. No one wanted it. No one set foot in the stores and they were scratching their heads. All this money, all this time, all this effort, all this good intention and it resulted in nothing. And, it, and they, they studied and studied and studied and it, it, it came to one clear conclusion. Most of the people in the Middle East are illiterate. They can't read a, a label. So how do they communicate? They communicate with pictures. So as you're walking down an aisle and you look at baby food, you look at the label, what's, what picture is on the label? A baby. The implication is there's a baby inside the jar and that no one explained it. No, that wasn't, so it never went anywhere. So that's, that's an example of how you don't enter a market, but it tells you a lot about what work you have to do, not including you know, financial reporting and the legal and law landscape of these countries. So um, it's a great question. Uh, it takes a lot of work to do right. Um, most companies don't do it very well, spend a lot of money and fail at it. Okay, uh, Susie, you got I, anything else? Anything else I was just gonna say, the one thing that I wanna add is, again, we've talked about this in, in our um, ball of confusion before, is it, it, do your homework. You have to do your homework, do the research. Again, you know, your secondary data, your primary data. And like Steve has explained before, that's so important. And also know the culture, like you said, Steve, of the people, of, of who your direct market is, because your local may be offensive to them. The, 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 all of that, you need to re-examine then even maybe the name of your company, depending. So just be aware of those things. And there's so many restrictions and other things that you need to actually take a look at the legalities of it all. So that's kind of my two cents. Yeah, that's <laughs> No, it's great. It's it's fascinating when you start looking at it. It, it almost, yes. if you do the research like Susan's talking about, you can conclude that it's not a good idea to enter some regions and countries because it's either too expensive or it takes too long. Right. So a lot of thought, a lot of planning has to go into this, maybe even more so than if you're going to do a domestic product launch in the United States mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of the familiarity with the processes. Right. Um, all right. Well, good week. Um, I think uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, close out our video for today. I encourage you to get in the forums. Uh, if you have a question about anything, post it in the, the Ball of Confusion forum and Susan and I will do another response uh, this time next week. Um, Susie, got anything else you wanna to add to build on or? No? I don't think so, nope. 
All right. Well, everybody have a great week and we'll see you in seven days.